Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you're coming in from. We appreciate you being here. Welcome to another GIA knowledge session. Uh, my name is Matthew Tratner. I'm joined by Dr. Evan Smith. And today we're going to talk about the science and stories behind diamond origin. So without further ado, uh, let's let's get started with a, uh, a topic that I'm very, very passionate about diamond origin and very, very happy to be able to be presenting with Dr. Smith here today. So the way that we're going to approach this is that I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, GIA, about why GIA is, is, has gotten into diamond origin, why it's important, and then Dr. Smith will take over and, uh, and share with you some of the science behind it, which is going to be really interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start here uh, again. Here's the two of us. I'm Matthew Tratner, Director of Global Business Development, and Dr. Smith uh, also with us. And who is GIA? So let's talk a little bit about who GIA is. Uh, we are the creator of the international grading system. We are the world's most trusted source for, for diamond grading. We are the creator of, of course, the four C's uh, known throughout the world. Some of the other things about us, we're also the creator of the gem microscope. Uh, from the first microscope to now, we continue, we continue to develop instruments such as the ID100 uh, that are helping to inform and educate uh, the public. And then, of course, we have the Richard Lidicote Gemological Library in Carlsbad. If you ever get the chance to come to the campus in Carlsbad, it hosts one of the world's largest and most complete collections of its kind. It is, it is unbelievable, truly impressive. And then why? Why are we doing this? Well, we think that this quote from our CEO, Susan Jock, really sums it up perfectly. Consumers purchasing one of Mother Nature's greatest treasures, a natural diamond form more than a billion years ago, will now know more about their diamond's journey and the positive impact it has on the communities and the countries where diamonds are discovered. So, so what does that mean? What it means is there is a huge amount of impact and positive change that is being affected on the world through the diamond industry. The issue sort of that this industry has always had is how do we tell those stories in a meaningful way? And, and part of that is about getting some of the, the, the facts out there. And I want to show you guys just sort of the, the tip of the iceberg, as it were. And, and, and this is just a few facts that uh, it came out of the research done by the Natural Diamond Council that just, again, scratches the surface of some of the unbelievable, meaningful things that are coming out of the diamond industry and the work being done. Over 90% of Botswana's population has access to clean water and electricity due to income generated by mining. I mean, that alone, the, the transformation of an entire country due to this industry is, is, is truly a remarkable thing. And then if we look at some of these other statistics, 100% of the mining sites in Canada must be returned to their original state to protect the environment. I mean, talk about the stewardship that these companies are doing in, their, in the backyards where they're digging out these diamonds. I mean, these are truly inspirational stories that we need to share. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about the logistics of how the, the program works, because the, the, the program, is really differentiated from some of the other programs that you've seen out there by our process and our science. And Dr. Smith's going to get into the, the details of the science, but let's talk about the process. So the way that it works is the only way that the Diamond Origin program can work is, is if GIA can analyze and see the rough before it gets cut and polished. If we cannot get and analyze the rough before it gets cut and polished, then the program does not work. So the first thing that has to happen is that the, the rough diamond has to be submitted to GIA. And the great thing is that the rough diamond can be submitted to any of our labs anywhere in the world, and that our scientists have gotten the process down to just about 48 hours of which we need to hold that rough because we understand that time is money in the diamond industry, and that the longer that we hold on to those uh, stones, the, the longer that it takes for our clients to go ahead and put them into the marketplace. So we've cut that process down to about 48 hours where we need to hold the rough. And the other great thing about that is that we are going to try to make up that time on the polished end, because any stone that is part of the diamond origin program 
that gets submitted as a polish stone gets put on a fast track. So the idea is that we're going to try to make this as frictionless as possible for the clients so that they can go ahead and use this process and take advantage of not only telling people where these diamonds come from, but those amazing stories behind it. So once that rough comes to us, our scientists analyze it. And then after that, it gets returned back to the client with a rough reference number. Now that rough reference number is great because when that stone gets submitted as polished at whatever point in the process that it might happen, that rough reference number helps GIS scientists go back and look at that first data set. Now there are ways to track down that, uh, to track down that data without it, but it, it becomes a much more difficult process. So the other great thing about the, this program and, and what is really at the core of it is that this rough stone now can go out into the world. It can change hands. It, it can be sold. It can be cut. It can be polished. And then once that happens, it gets resubmitted to GIA. And then at that point, our scientists do another analysis on the polished stone. They take those two data sets between the rough stone and the polished stone, and they make a match. If they match, the stone can get issued a diamond origin report with the country of origin listed. So that in essence is how it works. Now, again, with the polished, you could also submit uh, those polished stones to any of our labs. So you can submit the rough to any of our labs and you can submit the polished to any of our labs and it doesn't have to be the same lab. So if you submit the rough, let's say to our lab in Mumbai and you wanna submit the, the polished to our lab in Carlsbad, that's perfectly fine. So, that's how the, the process works. And then once again, that match is confirmed, we can issue a diamond origin report. And so here is the report. And here's how it differentiates from our diamond grading reports. First thing is on that left side there of the slide, you see on that front cover, the picture of both the polished and the rough. Gives you an idea right there that this is a different uh, report, it says you know diamond origin report there on the side. And then here on the right side of the screen, the big, Differentiator is right there at the bottom where it says country of origin and lists the country of origin uh, that it comes from. In this case, it's, it's Canada. There are several countries uh, that are participating in the program. And so it still has all of the same four C's information that you get on a diamond grading report. Uh, it comes with uh, the, the plotting, it comes with the, uh, the weight, the, uh, the color, uh, the, the cut, all of the things that you would expect on a diamond grading report with that extra piece of information about the geographic origin. So the program wouldn't be complete without some additional tools to be able to use to not only talk about the process, but also again, talk about these amazing stories. So what GI has done is we've created uh, a, a bunch of materials that work with this Diamond Origin Report and this Diamond Origin Program to help tell these stories and talk about these concepts. Everything from an app to printed materials to a microsite. And this microsite is really a wonderful uh, thing because it really encapsulates uh, all of what we are doing with Diamond Origin in one place. And, and here it is right here on the screen. It, it's discover.gia.edu slash diamond-origin.com. And that's really your go-to place on the web to find all of the information, the tools, the stories, how it works, all of the things that I've talked about can be found uh, right there on the Diamond Origin microsite. So I know that's a, a lot of information. And like I said at the end, uh, I'm sorry, oops, sorry. I skipped ahead a little bit there, uh, that Dr. Smith and I uh, will be answering questions. But that encapsulates my part of, of the presentation, talking a little bit about the stories behind it, how the process works. And now I am very pleased to go ahead and hand the uh, presentation over to Dr. Smith to really get into the science of it. Thank you, Matt. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an introduction into what the program is um, and, and why it's sort of structured the way it is. Now we're going to talk about how it works, the science behind the GIA Diamond Origin Report. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about uh, what actually happens behind the scenes to make all of this possible. 
So I want to start off with the idea of geographic origin for any gemstone and, and how you would actually obtain or establish this information. And I would break it down into two main scenarios. Scenario number one, um, the origin of this gemstone is known at the time of mining. So someone is there extracting this material from the earth. And at that point, the origin is an objective fact. Unfortunately, sometimes this information is lost when any given gemstone enters the marketplace. So the second scenario is where the origin is inferred based on physical and chemical features. For instance, analyzing any gem material for its inclusions or trace elements or other uh, key features like that. And in this scenario, the origin information is an expert opinion, uh, but it also kind of requires that different mines or deposits have gems with distinctive features so that you can tell them apart. And in the case of diamonds, there's a bit of a, a difficulty here because many diamonds from different deposits can have overlapping features, similar inclusions, similar morphologies, similar ranges of colors, and even uh, overlapping characteristics in terms of trace elements. So it can be difficult to do um, that kind of a determination. And I would say these are sort of barriers to inferring diamond origin. To break this down a little bit, just what I mean is that, okay, here's one diamond deposit. It's a kimberlite eruption here, and it contains diamonds with different physical properties. Here they're represented by different colors. What we can see, what we know geologically from studying diamonds is that any given deposit often will have multiple populations of diamonds and they can be mixed together. So when we mine diamonds from a single deposit, we can have diamonds that come from different host rocks or that might've formed at different times and they can have different shapes and very different properties. You can mine diamonds at a single deposit for, for a while and then encounter a new population of diamonds, perhaps deeper down in the kimberlite or off to one side of the kimberlite. So that's one difficulty that there can be a range of different kinds of diamonds in one deposit. The other sticking point is that when you compare different diamond deposits, sometimes what we see is broadly overlapping physical and chemical features of diamonds from different deposits. So we can have multiple different mines where the inclusions look very similar and they tell a very similar geological story uh, because many diamonds have formed through a similar recipe and that's just the way nature works. Um, what kinds of features am I talking about here in terms of uh, trying to infer the origin of a diamond? We could be talking about the size, the color, the clarity, growth habits, inclusions like in this diamond here, even talking about more complex things like carbon isotopic signatures or nitrogen concentrations, aggregation states, nitrogen isotopes, atomic scale defects that you might detect with photoluminescence, spectroscopy, or even trace elements. These are all features that we could potentially try to observe in diamonds and try to guess or, or make an educated opinion about where they come from. So, you know, the reason why diamonds are a little bit different uh, compared to other gemstones comes back to the idea of how diamonds form. So we should discuss a little bit about how diamonds form uh, compared to other gem materials. Most minerals around us, almost everything that we can see and touch and extract by mining, most of this material has formed in the Earth's crust, relatively close to the surface of the earth, maybe as deep as a few kilometers is the deepest we're ever going to be mining materials. But diamonds form much deeper in the earth. They come from a very different place, a very different geological setting down in the earth's mantle. And the only reason we get to see them up at the surface of the earth is because of special volcanic eruptions, uh, predominantly kimberlites, that bring them up to surface. 
So diamonds form very deep in the earth, maybe around 150 to 200 kilometers, sometimes even deeper. And kimberlites are the reason why uh, they can get all the way up to surface where we could mine them or where they might be uh, eroded into rivers and beaches where they form alluvial deposits where they could be mined. So here's kind of a cross section into the earth. Uh, this green blob in the middle here, this is a slice into a continent. And diamonds, most of them that we're mining nowadays, they have formed in the sort of thickest and oldest parts of continents in a region we call the Craton. And the depth of this space here, the sort of diamond window where most diamonds come from is around 150 to 200 kilometers deep. And occasionally there are even special kinds of diamonds called super deep diamonds that, that come from even deeper in the earth. Now, how do we actually know any of this information? Well, we've learned a lot from studying inclusions in diamonds. So here's a, a diamond here growing deep in the earth. And as it gets larger, sometimes it can envelop or include some neighboring mineral grain. So this is a, a little physical sample from deep in the earth and the diamond protects it really well. When this material comes up to surface, we might be fortunate enough to find a diamond with an inclusion that's a, like a little snapshot of the place and time where the diamond grew deep in the earth. Sometimes we can also see chunks of rock called xenoliths that have been brought up from very deep in the earth as well. So we've learned a lot from studying material trapped in diamonds. And this is where we get a lot of our um, sort of hypotheses about how diamonds actually form in nature. Let's take a look at sort of how this works. Actually, there are multiple ways that diamonds can form. Um, and this could involve different fluids or different kinds of host rocks. But generally, the picture might be something like this, where we've got, this is a slice through a, a special kind of rock called peridotite, and it has these purple garnets in it in this case. And we can imagine that at some point in Earth's history, there's a pulse of fluid. And this carbon-bearing fluid infiltrates into this rock. And if we're lucky, carbon might precipitate from this fluid and crystallize a diamond. And here you can see a diamond that has captured one of these uh, purple chrome pyrope garnets. So this is sort of the picture we're thinking of when we're imagining diamond growth in nature. And this rock that the diamond is growing in, called a host rock, is one of two major kinds of host rocks for diamond. So you've got peridotite, uh, like shown here on the right. So this is a diamond and it contains a little inclusion, uh, mineral inclusion of olivine. And this is an example of a diamond that we think is grown in this host rock called peridotite. The other major host rock type for diamond is eclogite. And often we see little inclusions of garnets that can be orange like this. And much more rarely, we can see these vibrant blue inclusions. This is a mineral called kyanite. But these are the uh, main two rock types that diamonds grow in. And the interesting thing is that when we look at many, many diamond deposits around the world, we see these two major flavors of diamonds reappearing, these same two sort of predominant suites of mineral inclusions. Um, so we see that diamonds around the world have grown under sort of broadly similar geological conditions. There can be variations in the host rock fluid um, interactions or different types of host rocks themselves, and occasionally even uh, different depths of diamond formation or different timings of diamond formation. But broadly, we're seeing sort of repetitions on the same types of diamond formation themes. So if we come back to these two scenarios and we want to establish the geographic origin for diamond, scenario number two, trying to infer its origin based on its physical and chemical features is extremely difficult. And currently there is no robust way to establish this kind of inference. So we're much better off getting our information from scenario one if we know the origin at the time of mining, 
a much more robust approach is to hold on to that information, keep track of that information through the supply chain. And then we have this origin attached to the diamond that is an objective fact. And this is the approach that the diamond origin report takes. And keeping track of this origin information isn't exactly something new. It's been done before for a select few diamonds through history, such as the Hope Diamond. Um, this is a diamond whose origin is known because it's a particularly large and beautiful, valuable diamond. We can trace it through historical records. And we know it was mined in the 1600s in uh, India here. So, this is something that is possible. And now in modern times where we have everything being digitized, it's much easier to create robust digital records of things. So um, keeping track of the origin of diamonds nowadays is not a, an unreasonable task. And it means that diamonds like this one uh, could have an origin attached to them. So let's talk about some of the different origins of diamonds. Here are sort of a, this is a summary of many of the world's diamond deposits, um, especially if you keep track of the little green symbols here. One of the interesting things we know is that diamonds, uh, diamond deposits tend to occur on these regions of the map that are gray or brown. These are the parts of the continents that are thick and old uh, before we call these cratons. So the diamonds have a tendency to occur within the thickest and oldest parts of continents. And this is where many of the world's diamond deposits occur. Uh, so now we're gonna take a look at just a few of these to give you some examples of what uh, diamond mines actually look like. Here's one of my favorites. This is in Northern Canada, about 300 kilometers Northeast of Yellowknife, a mine called Diavik. And you can see here, it's like a big pit in the ground. This is an open pit mine. And they're extracting the kimberlite here. There are two neighboring kimberlite deposits here. One of the interesting things about this mine is it has this ridge around it. And this is actually a dam to keep water from going into the mine because this region around the perimeter where it's all flat, and this is obviously in the winter time, this is a lake. Um, so this dam prevents the lake from flooding into this open pit. Uh, an interesting diamond that came from this deposit uh, was this one here in 2018, the largest diamond ever found in North America at 552 carats. Uh, it was an interesting yellow color. And just a few months ago in June, the largest polished material from this diamond was sold for um, almost five million dollars. This diamond was called the Dancing Sun and just tipped the scales over 200 carats. Beautiful, fancy, intense yellow color. Here's another example of a diamond mine. This is the Lomonosov mine in northwest Russia. And again, this is an open pit mine and they're extracting uh, kimberlite rock, this volcanic rock that transports diamonds. You can see in the bottom of the pit here, there's some machinery down here, this little stick looking thing is a drill rig. Uh, so it's quite a large um, open pit mine here. So some of the diamonds from this mine are shown here. And you can see a, a range of colors from colorless to yellows and grays and even some pink diamonds. And now that the Argyle mine in Australia has closed, this might be an important source of pink diamonds in the future. Here's another uh, diamond mine. This one I actually had the privilege of taking a tour of. This is the Karowe mine in Botswana. And there are three kimberlites in here, uh, or three regions of the kimberlite. It's uh, all sort of blended together. It's hard to tell what's what, but this sort of grayish green color that you see at the very bottom of the pit, that difference in color is actually the difference in host rock. So this is the, the kimberlite material here. And around the perimeter where it's a different color, that's actually a different rock type. Um, so the kimberlite itself doesn't extend all the way to the outside of this pit. Um, this is sort of the way that open pit mining works. You have to dig a hole that's a little bit bigger than the actual deposit itself. But some of the diamonds that uh, 
come from this pit are very, very large, uh, large, high quality type 2A diamonds even. Uh, an example of some of the most famous diamonds from this deposit are shown here in this slide. So here's a collection of very large, high quality diamonds. The largest of the collection here is the Lissetti Lorona, which was 1,109 carats. But around the same time, all of these other uh, diamonds were recovered from the same mine. And one, uh, one idea is that these might have all actually come from a single, very large rough diamond that uh, came apart, it fragmented, either due to natural causes or perhaps due to the effects of mining. It's hard to establish, but we can uh, determine from its physical properties that this would have been one large diamond, a remarkable sized diamond. So obviously all of these um, diamonds, by the time they make it into the marketplace, they get cut and polished. Um, and this is an example of uh, one particular diamond making its way from the stages of being rough through blocking and faceting to become a beautiful finished diamond here on the right. So how does this actually work with the uh, diamond origin report? How is the matching done? Well, like Matt already said, one of the most important aspects of this program is that to make it work, the rough diamond needs to be evaluated by GIA first. So that needs to be seen in order to sort of record its properties, essentially to take its fingerprint. That way we can recognize that it's the same diamond later on after it's changed hands many times and been cut and polished into some faceted material. Here's another example of uh, a diamond through the stages from rough to polished. And I'd like to talk about some of the analytical techniques that GIA uses in order to take this fingerprint and be able to recognize that it's the same diamond. One technique is shown here. So this is visible absorption spectroscopy. And it's easier to understand this idea if we talk about it in terms of color. So along the bottom axis here, we've sort of got white light split up into all the different wavelengths. So it's like a rainbow. We've got uh, orange at one end here and red in the longer wavelengths. And then as you move to shorter wavelengths, you get down into blue uh, colors here. And on the vertical axis is showing absorb absorbance. So this is the amount of light that's being absorbed by the diamond. Um, and if we look at this in terms of wavelengths, we can see there's a lot of absorbance here in the blue and then extending into the green region. A lot of this light is being absorbed. And then over here, you have less absorbance. You have more transmission. So this light at the red end of the spectrum is actually making it through this diamond. That's why this diamond appears red. Uh, so a lot of the other colors besides red are being absorbed and the light that's making it through is red. So this is one type of spectroscopy um, that actually pertains to visible light that we can see, but we also use techniques using infrared light that you can't see. So this is light of longer wavelengths that your eye can't detect. Here we're into the infrared range. And this, what we can see here, these are two absorption spectra using infrared light. If we just concentrate on the bottom spectrum here, this red line, you can see some very uh, interesting features here, uh, kind of complex shape. All of these features here are due to the diamond itself. So this is infrared absorption due to just the carbon and the way it's bonded as a diamond. So this is telling you that we have a diamond and in terms of infrared absorption spectroscopy, we don't see anything else in the diamond. It looks very pure in terms of this spectroscopy. And for this reason, this is a type 2A diamond. This is how we actually classify diamonds into different types. Um, up here in the black line, this is a different kind of diamond. This is a type 1A diamond. And it has those same features due to the absorption of the diamond itself but it also has some peaks here. 
And these are due to absorption from nitrogen in the diamond that's formed in its uh, pairs of nitrogen and groups of four along with a vacancy. So those are A centers and B centers. So this is a type 1A diamond. It contains nitrogen and the nitrogen is aggregated. This is very common for uh, many natural diamonds that they are type 1A. So this is some piece of information that we can collect from a diamond and add to its record in terms of uh, its nitrogen uh, concentration and its nitrogen aggregation state, and even whether it has nitrogen or not. So do the spectral features for the rough and polished match? This is the sort of the question that's being asked when we see a rough diamond take its fingerprint in terms of spectroscopy and other physical characteristics, and then we see its polished diamond later, we're asking the question, do these match? Are they from the same material? And this is in addition to sort of the normal things you might uh, think to regard about the diamond, the size, the color, the clarity. Are these things reasonable it, that this polished diamond could have been cut from this rough diamond? Um, the spectroscopy, um, you want that to match, but you also want it to make sense that the diamond hasn't gotten any bigger or it's changed color drastically because those things would obviously be impossible. So all of these things are part of establishing that this polished diamond came from a given rough diamond and making that comparison. Let me show you an example of this in action. So here's a rough diamond that was submitted to GIA for this rough analysis. It's 5.91 carats. It's a nice octahedral crystal shape. And then later the polish that was resubmitted is 1.01 carats. So in terms of its color um, and its size, I mean, this makes sense that this could have been cut from this diamond, but um, the whole idea of sort of the fingerprint and using spectroscopy as part of this allows us to get a little bit more technical and dig into the details. So here's the visible absorption spectrum from each of those two stones. In the red line here, that's the rough diamond, and the black or the greenish line here, that's the polished diamond. And when we compare these two, we can see they have a similar slope, similar levels of absorbance, and they have these key um, peaks here. So they have uh, absorption from the same spectral features. So these two are a very nice match. They are showing you that this is the same material, at least in terms of the visible absorption spectroscopy. And we would also go to the infrared absorption spectroscopy as well. So here we can see, remember this is the infrared range and we have this uh, sort of complex region of peaks here that's due to the diamond itself. But we really wanna pay a lot of attention to this region of the spectrum here where we would expect to see nitrogen or the absence of nitrogen. In this case, the diamond, both the rough and the polished have similar levels of nitrogen, similar concentrations of nitrogen, and the shapes of these peaks here are similar. So they're showing you that they have the same relative proportions of A centers and B centers. So this is a diamond with the same um, ratios of atomic scale defects in it and the same proportions of atomic scale defects in terms of the nitrogen. We can also take this uh, a step further and do some observations with UV fluorescence imaging. So this is deep UV. So this is actually a shorter wavelength than a standard gem UV lamp that would have short wave and long wave. This is deep UV fluorescence imaging. For instance, this is the kind of illumination you have in the diamond view instrument uh, where it's actually not safe for your eyes. So the whole uh, instrument has to be enclosed and you're actually viewing the diamond through a camera hooked up to a computer. And what we can see here in the deep UV fluorescence, at least these images are showing you, you've got the same kind of color. Uh, so you've got the same kind of defects that are luminescing between the rough and the polished. And we have similar uh, patterns that are appearing here. Um, and what we're seeing is sort of a uniform blue here without particularly pronounced zonation. And this is the same thing that we see here. We don't see 
um, very strong zones in the luminescence or any kind of sharp banding or other features. So this matches here as well. So these diamonds, these are the same diamonds, the rough and the polished match up very well in terms of all the information that's been collected. Let's look at another example. So here's a 5.07 carat diamond and the polish that is being claimed to have been cut from this rough. If we take a look at the visible absorption spectrum, here we can see the rough in this red line here and the polished stone down here. And we see a similar slope and we see sort of an absence of any kind of sharp spectral features. We don't see peaks or valleys in this, um, in either one of these spectra. So they're matching. They're showing the same sorts of response from the, the material being tested. And if we take this and now look at the infrared absorption spectroscopy and compare these spectra, what we see is this, um, complex feature here. Again, that's just due to the diamond itself. And if we're paying more attention to this region over here, where we would expect nitrogen to be present, what we can see in both the rough and the polished is that there's no absorption due to nitrogen. So this is below the detection limit of infrared absorption spectroscopy. And these would both be classified as a type 2a diamond. So so far, these look like they're the same material. If we look over here in this region here, there's a small feature that we would zoom in on and pay even more attention to. Uh, right here at the position of 3,107 wave number, what we can see is a very, very tiny, tiny peak, uh, just a little tiny bump. So this is something that uh, is a very good sign that we see a small peak at this position present in both the rough and polished. This defect, which is related to the presence of hydrogen in the diamond, this defect is present in both the rough and the polished and present at a very small quantity. So these features are matching very well. These other bumps here, uh, this is due to surface dirt. So this is just like things like fingerprints can cause absorption here. But this peak here is due to the diamond itself. So this is an encouraging sign. And if we take this and look at the fluorescence imaging, what we can see is, well, the rough and the polished have a similar color. And they also have a similar pattern to them too. It's difficult to see in these images, but this particular diamond has a very fine scale uh, kind of network pattern, uh, dislocation network pattern is what you would call it. And this very fine pattern is present in both the, the rough and the polished. So all of these signs are very good. So these are just some examples of the kinds of information that are collected from the rough and the polished. There's one more kind of spectroscopy I wanted to bring your attention to that's used in this process, and that's photoluminescence spectroscopy. So with this technique, the diamond is excited with a laser under a microscope and the light given off by the diamond is brought back up into the optics of the instrument and separated with a, a spectrometer, it's detected. And we can sort of see what colors of light essentially are given off by the diamond when it's excited by this laser uh, illumination. So here this diamond is being excited with a, a laser. The laser wavelength is 830 nanometers and we're looking at the, the features, the light being given off by the diamond. What we can see here is a, a sharp peak here. In this case, this is due to just the diamond itself. We already know that both of these stones are diamonds, so we can ignore this peak here labeled diamond Raman. What we're really looking at is this peak over here. So in the rough diamond, there was a small little peak here at 953. And in the polished diamond, we can see the same peak here at 953 with about the same intensity. So this is a very good indication that we have the same atomic scale defects present in this diamond that are giving us this photoluminescence response and present at about the same concentrations. So this is another layer of information that's showing us that this is the same material we've analyzed in the rough state and in the polished state. So this journey 
of a diamond through the marketplace um, is now possible to attach this information of diamond origin. So diamonds like these, rough diamond, these uh, polished diamonds here, we can now not just appreciate them for their clarity, their cut, their carrot weight, their color. We can also appreciate some of the natural story behind them because they have this origin information that's been preserved. So if we try to summarize this process in this, uh, this sort of represents the supply chain of, of diamond here going from a mine all the way to the customer who's enjoying it in a, in a piece of jewelry. So the idea is that when a diamond is mined, it's extracted from the earth, its origin is known as an objective fact. And at that point, if GIA can evaluate the rough, we can take images, make measurements, uh, do analyses to record essentially the fingerprint of that diamond. And then later, when this diamond has gone through many hands, it's been cut and polished, and eventually at some point it is resubmitted to GIA uh, for grading, this matching process can verify that it's the same diamond. So based on the fact that we've seen the rough, there's this information that we can pull from, GIA will reference that rough analysis and perform a kind of a, a matching operation and see if the information is pertaining to the same material, if we can confirm that this is the same diamond. And at this point, there's also the complete grading assessment, everything that you would normally expect from uh, a diamond um, report. So this, this process allows you to take this objective fact of the diamond origin and bring it all the way down the supply chain. So that now you have a diamond with this piece of information attached to it where the origin is known and it can be appreciated as such. So this is kind of an overview of how it works from start to finish. Uh, and I think right now we have some time for questions. If you have anything outstanding that you'd like some clarification on, we'd be happy to take some of those questions now. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That was fantastic. And uh, yes, we do have we do have some questions. Uh, and, and the first one I can actually answer because the first one was asked is, is this a theory or are we doing this? And, and we are doing this. Uh, we, we have been for quite some time. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a program that is up running. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is very robust. And so, so yes, this is, this is something that, that GIA is evaluating uh, rough diamonds uh, and then evaluating the polish and making these, these matches. So um, the, the, there's a couple of questions here about uh, Argyle. So uh, if we could talk about Argyle for a second. Uh, the first question is about why, why did it close? And then the follow-up question to that was, what, in your opinion, uh, made it such a great uh, source for, for that particular pink, for the pink, the colors, those types of things? Yeah, so uh, the, the first part is, is relatively easy. Uh, why did it close? Essentially, they ran out of diamonds. Um, now, that's putting it a little bit too simplistically. Um, you never really run out of diamonds entirely. There's a cost associated with mining the diamonds and, and you hope that there's a profit that will, you know, sort of cover those costs and then some. And eventually you get to a point where the deposit is smaller and smaller or deeper and deeper and the costs of extracting a diamond from that deposit are more and more expensive and they can no longer justify the revenue of selling those diamonds. And once you reach this tipping point, uh, it's no longer a money maker. It, you, you're no longer making money by actually trying to extract diamonds from this deposit. And that's essentially what has happened at Argyle. And that's what happens at, uh, at any mine. It just sort of depends on the, the size of the deposit, how long its lifespan will be. Now, Argyle was special for a couple reasons. One, the rock type they were mining was technically not a kimberlite, it was a lamproite. And that was the only major mine of its kind where they're mining lamproite and not kimberlite. 
it's a very similar related kind of volcanic eruption, uh, but the, the in details, the petrography, the rock type is slightly different. So we've just never found a quite something like that before. And the other part of it is why so many of these diamonds were pink. What was it that was special about Argyle? And the answer to that question is, well, we don't know fully in great detail, but we think that the pressure and temperature history of those diamonds was a little bit different from some other deposits around the world. We think that those diamonds at Argyle were subjected to plastic deformation at just the right conditions um, to make a lot of pink color and allow that pink color to be well preserved and uh, sort of as, as abundant as it is at that mine. So we think that the pink color is directly related to uh, diamond deformation. So this requires that the rocks around the diamond, while it was still in the Earth's mantle, those rocks have moved a bit and caused the diamond essentially to be squished at the atomic scale. And when it's sort of squished and this deformation is occurring within the diamond crystal, this causes defects that can make the diamond pink. So that kind of special setting seems to have been amplified at Argyle compared to some other mines around the world. So Argyle in particular had a lot of pink diamonds because it had just the right geological conditions. Thank you very much. Um, and that, that kind of leads us to our next question, which is more, more for me and, and, and my, my end of things, which is about the sources of where the rough is, is coming from. And uh, so GI is working with all of the major uh, mining companies uh, that are out there, which are all very, you know, at, at this point, all of the mining companies are very heavily uh, regulated. They have to uh, produce a lot of documentation and work with the, the governments in the areas where they're mining. And so GIA has access to uh, that information to be able to track that rough back to where it comes from. We also have uh, a lot of processes internally in place that have been audited to make sure that the type of documentation and, and things that we're accepting uh, are, uh, are proving where the diamond uh, came out of the ground. The great thing about this program is that we're working with uh, in many different countries. So it opens up that ability to tell all of those stories. One of the great things also about this program is that we're trying to open it up and we are working with artisanal miners, for instance, in South Africa. And, uh, and, and in other ways, our, our India team uh, has been working with secondary manufacturers as well, because we don't want uh, we don't want to exclude anyone from this program. We want uh, manufacturers who receive the rough even after it's been mined, try to figure out ways to be able to submit uh, that rough to this program properly. So, so that, that, that I think should answer the question as far as, as, far as sourcing. Uh, one of the other uh, great uh, uh, questions here was about the science. And let me get to it here, right here. Uh, and it says that if... It's about the, the type. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got a lot of good questions coming in here. So it, is it possible that different type of uh, 1A diamonds show similar or identical nitrogen peaks on the IR spectra? And if so, how would you differentiate between those, one, those type 1A diamonds? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're sort of showing you type 1a because it's it's a it's an easy way to, to approach infrared spectroscopy as an introduction but that's true a lot of like a lot of diamonds 99 percent of them out there are going to be type 1a and they could have a centers and b centers and just out of the statistics of ha having you know millions of diamonds you're going to have some that have similar concentrations and look similar in infrared absorption spectroscopy uh, and sort of the answer is, well, that's why that's just one part of the fingerprint. Um, so we're looking not just for the concentration of nitrogen and what form it's in, but this goes much further into looking at the, the size and the color and the clarity of the diamond, and then looking at the growth structure in uh, deep UV fluorescence imaging, and then also taking it a step further and looking at photoluminescence spectroscopy, where you can actually uh, detect more defects besides just the nitrogen, but looking at other kinds of atomic scale defects 
that are more varied in nature, uh, that we can uh, pick up more, uh, more detailed information about any given stone. When we have those additional layers of information, then we can still discriminate between all these different diamonds and, uh, you know, any two diamonds have a distinct fingerprint for themselves. Okay. I, I love these questions because they make me sound smart when I ask them. So this is, this is, this is, this is, this is good stuff. Uh, would the diamond site be from the alluvial site or the kimberlite pipe? Sorry, the diamond type? Uh, it says, it said, would the diamond site, I guess, would, would the diamond be coming from the alluvial site or the kimberlite pipe is, I believe, the question. Okay, I, I, think, I think it's saying like what the origin would be labeled as. Is that going to be the alluvial deposit or backtrack to whatever kimberlite it came from? And the answer is it's it's tied to the mining location. So if a diamond is recovered at an alluvial deposit, that that alluvial deposit is where the diamond has been mined. Um, there, there's a question here about you know you pointed out those uh, surface uh, dirt uh, peaks on on the scale. There was a question here about how do you tell the difference uh, between something that is let's say surface dirt and something that's not. Yeah. Uh, so I guess there are two parts to that, uh, to the answer there. One, we know the location, the, the location of those peaks. 3107 is something we know for sure is part of the diamond. And also the location of those, uh, what I labeled grease or dirt or whatever that is, we know the location of those peaks as well. And you you can verify that it's dirt on the surface of the diamond by cleaning the diamond. Uh, if you take that diamond and simply wipe it off with ethanol, you can remove those peaks and verify that it was something on the surface of the diamond and not something internal and intrinsic to the diamond itself. Gotcha. Uh, here is a question that I like because I know the answer to it. And I know this is actually a, a good a good story, so to speak. So is it possible for diamonds from the same mine, geographic location, to have drastically different ID characteristics where you can't match them up, even if you know that they've come from the same place? Um, you mean the rough and the polished? Yes. Um, yeah, so it's possible that uh, diamonds, as they grow, they grow in stages, they grow in layers, and you can end up with a diamond that has multiple zones to it, zones with different characteristics. And that's an important point. When you're polishing a diamond, you're taking this sort of whole stone and removing part of it. It's possible that you could remove um, one of these zones. You could remove an area with an inclusion, for instance, that looked characteristic uh, earlier. Now, you could also remove part of the diamond that was a certain, uh, that had a certain defect within it. And then you're left with something else that looks different, but it still contains um, part of that fingerprint. So it's almost like uh, you're removing some regions of the fingerprint, but you can still tell that it's the same stone if you put all of those pieces back together. In fact, we expect in many cases that um, you know the polishing process is going to remove material. We know it's going to remove weight. We know it's going to change the shape of the diamond, but it's also not uh, unfathomable that parts of the spectroscopic information that we detected in the rough might be missing from the polished stone because that material has been removed still make a match yes great thank you um there's a there's a lot of questions here about sort of after the fact in a sense can can why can't people take their polished diamonds or take famous polished diamonds that haven't been looked at and 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 analyze them and find out you know where they came from yeah and that's you know that's sort of always been the holy grail that people have had in the back of their mind that you could take any any diamond without any information and be able to tell where it comes from. And sometimes you can do that. And it's, it's a, an inferred expert opinion that you're getting in that case. So you could do that, um, but it's hard to verify what the truth really is. When, when you've got an expert opinion, um, 
two different experts might give you different opinions. And that's valid. That's part of making such an inference. Um, the difficult part is that some diamonds are easier to do this with than others. It's not possible to do this robustly with all diamonds. Um, a diamond that's, that's easier to do it with, for instance, if you had an argyle pink, quite often these have some distinct characteristics and we can tell, well, that probably is an argyle pink. We won't know 100%, but just looking from the characteristics, we can say it's probably that. Or if you had a blue type 2B diamond that's colored by boron, most of those diamonds, uh, we think, come from a particular mine in South Africa, uh, the Premier Mine, used to be called the Cullinan Mine. No, now it's called the Cullinan Mine, it used to be called the Premier Mine. Um, you know, you could say, well, it probably came from that mine. But again, this isn't something that you can do robustly with 100% accuracy for all diamonds. The only way to approach this um, with a high level of confidence and a high level of standardization is to keep that source information from the time of mining and hold on to it. That's the reason why we're saying the GIA needs to see the rough beforehand to establish it in a robust and traceable manner. Thank you. Um, I know we're coming up on time. We do have some, some great questions here. Um, the, the, the next question is really about does any of the analysis that we do on either the polish or the rough affect the diamond in any way? Yeah, that, that's an easy one. The answer is no. Um, we're using the same kinds of analytical techniques that we've been using for many years. Um, various kinds of spectroscopy and you know, imaging. These are all things that don't modify the diamond in any way. So it, it will not be harmed or modified. And, and then there's another question about uh, about the conditions for diamond formation. Um, is there is there somewhere like a major locality? Let's say they're they're asking. I guess is there somewhere that's not yet been kind of uh, mined at that might be considered a a place where you might go looking for diamonds, where it's not necessarily you know ready made to be to be mined. Let's say I think that's what the question is. <laughs> Um, well, this is, this is something that exploration companies would like to know. There are, you know, every year there are millions of dollars spent on trying to find new diamond deposits. So this is an active uh, kind of scene for, for new mining localities. People are trying to find new deposits. And I guess the simplest answer is that there are probably new diamond deposits close to where old diamond deposits are. That's the best place to look, is look where we have found things before. Uh, the other answer may be more speculative, uh, that maybe there are diamonds in places like Antarctica or Greenland, where we haven't had the chance to explore for materials like this because they're covered in ice. Okay. Uh, and this next question, I think, is, is, would be something I can answer. It's about the, the sizes. Uh, the, the smallest polish size uh, that uh, we give a diamond origin report to is 15 points. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no maximum uh, size for the service. Uh, so I know that was a question in there. Um, and I think that we're coming up on time. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for, for presenting with me again. It's always such a pleasure. I love doing it with you. It, it, to Likewise. talk about this, this uh, subject is great. Uh, and with that, I, I would just say again, thank you to everybody else and, uh, and have a fantastic day.